We interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. The reports of a flying saucer hovering over the city have been confirmed. Did you really go out with an alien? Uh-huh. What was it like? Real different. Becoming Human, a Mork and Mindy podcast. Previously on Becoming Human. Mindy was such a beautiful bride. But Cora, they're honeymooning on Ork. Why can't they go to the Poconos? Oh, Dad, it's when Mort grew up. He just wants to share it with me. Men, wake up. Look on the scanner. We're here. <gasps> oh, Mort. Ork is beautiful. Well, yeah. <laughs> Think me, Minnie McConnell, the first woman in space. Well, you're not the first one. There was a Russian lady, but you're the first one that shaves her legs. <laughs> It's just amazing. Oh, I know, man. I mean, this hotel, everything is just so futuristic. Yes, Mark. And this must be your wife, the Earthling. Well, it takes all kinds. Hello. Hello. Uh, 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 Why do I feel like the elephant man? Uh, man, I'm sorry. I want to make the honeymoon something very, very special. No, it's not your fault. It's just been such a long trip, and and our rooms weren't ready. In fourth place. <laughs> the way the next scene starts out is interesting because Mark opens the door from the hallway to their room, so we just see this darkened room, and even the hall looks dark because we can barely see their spacesuits. He tells her that this is an intergalactic class hotel. They modify each room to satisfy the needs of the specific aliens, so I guess in a sense it caters to out-of-towners. He says it's going to be like any Ramada Inn on Earth, right down to the little paper sash on the commode. She laughs. And then she tells him it's customary to be carried over the threshold. He says, oh, all right, men, but I'm a little heavy. He tries to climb into her arms. She says, her, not him. He grabs her around the waist and then clumsily sets her down a few inches into the room. She says, thanks, Mork. That was real romantic. And that's another thing that's going on is Mindy has these ideas about what would be romantic on a honeymoon. She will learn that romance isn't necessarily the cliches and old customs that she grew up on. It's actually things that are more heartfelt. Yeah, it does feel a little bit odd that with all of Mork's movie and TV viewing, he never actually saw the thing of the groom carrying the bride over the threshold. But there may be gaps. Someone, probably Mork, based on what we see when the lights come on again, closes the door, and now the room is pitch dark. Well, man, this is just like any room on Earth. I mean, lots of rooms I've seen on Earth with uh, floor paper and wall rugs and <laughs> ceiling chairs. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 they screwed it up. I'm sorry. Looks like it was decorated by fools or us. <laughs> oh, man, how could they do this to me? Oh, too much coffee, Tom. Mark, it's all right. Oh, it is? No, but you're distraught. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> oh, man, I mean, I just wanted our honeymoon to be something very, very special. Oh, I know. Look, the important thing is that we're together, and it is our honeymoon. Oh. In the dictionary, it says compassionate. See you. <laughs> I love you, Bart. I love you, man. <laughs> Dong, Dong ding. <laughs> The music emphasizes the alien feel. We can see that this is a failed attempt to look Earthish. It made me wonder if they just never have Earthlings, which I guess is implied that Mindy is the first Earthling there, or at least in Bleems. We can see that she's annoyed and he's trying to save the situation and he refers to the floor paper and the wall rugs. So it's like everything is there, but not in the right place. And that's symbolic, of course. And then he gets upset set and he refers to Fools R Us which is the second Toys R Us reference this season and then he says too much coffee Tom that is a commercial reference I don't remember which coffee but there would be one man Tom or whatever his name would be in the commercial who would be in a bad mood and then somebody would remark to him too much coffee and why don't you switch to Folgers or what have you so it's just this quick commercial reference that made me laugh even though I couldn't really place it and there 
there's a lot in this episode that just kind of hit me. I know I've seen the episode before, not in many years. It just kind of hit me from the side. Like, oh, I didn't see that coming. And that made it funnier. And he just throws that in. That yes, it's him talking to himself, trying to soothe himself. Then Mindy tries to soothe him, but she admits it's not all right. So I thought that was nice that she is trying to be understanding, but she's not denying her own feelings. She's just not going to talk about them right at this moment because Mork is distraught. So this is very sweet of her. And it's very sweet how they're both glad that they're on their honeymoon. And he says, if you look at the word compassionate in the dictionary, it has Mindy. So that again, they like that quality in each other, the compassion. And they exchange I love yous. And then they almost kiss, but then the doorbell goes and then they repeat it together. Dong, ding, because part of this hotel room being out of whack is that even the doorbell has the right pieces, but not in the right order. Mark says they can even screw up the doorbell. Mindy thinks it's the bellhops with their luggage. She asks if they tip the bellhops on work. And so that's the thing of you go to a foreign place and like, do you tip? How much do you tip? And then of course, Mork takes it literally because these are robots. And if you tip them, they can't get back on their feet. He opens the door to what look like twins. And it's two men in red and black and they're both wearing glasses. They both say, surprise! And it turns out to be PV clones six and seven and they each have their number on them. Mindy says hello. And one of them says that she must be Mindy, Mork's wife, whatever that is. And then they laugh hard. And it's interesting, they don't bark laugh. They just laugh enthusiastically like humans. Seven says he heard that Mork was back. I don't know from whom. And they could hardly wait to get up here, meaning up to his hotel suite. He says Six thought it would be funny if they brought up Mork and Mindy's luggage. Six says they had to tip the robot and you could still see him outside. So Mork goes and looks in the hallway and he says that the robot's little feet are just flailing away. He closes the door again. Mork tells Mindy that he and the clones go way back. And then they do a cheer, which I will show you in a clip later because it's the same thing. And it goes Rick'em, Rack'em, Ruck'em, Ruck'em, get that ball and really fight. And then there's brief applause. And that they did this twice, teasing the censor with what sounds like it's going to be a naughty rhyme and then isn't. Mork and the clones used to sneak into the bathroom, presumably at school. Mork got caught for being funny and that's why he was sent to Earth. And that makes it sound like Mork was sent to Earth straight out of high school, but maybe it was part of his record that this is somebody who used to be funny, which is a terrible thing to do in an orc. Nonetheless, he has these two good friends that love jokes. Very bad jokes, as we'll find. And then Six says, wait till they hear their latest Orson joke. This is really gonna short your circuit. Okay, now watch those sides. Here it goes. Orson is a big fat toe. Well, you were the only one caught. There's a common thing. I don't know if you see it as much these days, maybe like in kids media, where twins speak simultaneously. It makes sense that you have the clones telling this Orson joke together. And of course, it's a fat joke. And then Mindy implies that Mork is the only funny one because six and seven don't seem particularly funny. Six and seven want to make themselves at home. So seven pulls down the couch from the wall and he sits on his face. They've got a lot of catch up to do. Six says Mork's human friend is really going to appreciate this one. And there's a sense here that they don't really understand what a wife is. They get that this is Mork's friend, but they don't know that there's anything beyond that. And they just think, hey, Mork and his friend are in town. Let's hang out. He taps Seven's butt, so Seven stands. And I'll just mention right now, these two are played by two brothers. Ronald Welch is clone six and Donald Welch is clone seven and they don't seem to have any other credits. I don't know that they're actually twins. I mean, they look alike, but I wasn't sure if they were identical. Him tapping his clone on the butt came across differently than if it was just some random guy. Like it's almost like tapping your own butt. Seven stands up. How many earthlings does it take to screw in a light bulb? I don't know. How many earthlings does it take to screw in a light bulb? One! <laughs> <laughs> So 
again, they're telling a joke as a team, and then they both sit on their faces. Mork and Mindy both look annoyed, and of course, she more than him, but even though he's probably happy to see his old friends, this is not good timing. Then we get sort of a swipe transition, and now Mork and Mindy are in their sleepwear. She's lying on the bed as if she's exhausted. Her head is at the foot of the bed. Mork is closing the door. She sits up as he comes over and says they're gone. They sit at the foot of the bed together, and she says she's had colds that didn't hang on as long as the PV clones. Mork says he thought they'd take the hint when he and Mindy put on their nightgowns. And it was interesting to me that he refers to his red and white nightshirt as a nightgown. Yes, he's also wearing the matching nightcap. And I thought it was interesting that she is not wearing a skimpy or sexy nightgown. I mean, it's not prim, but it's long and it's off-white with an open white robe. For some reason, it looks like she's wearing ballet slippers. Mindy thought the PV clones would take the hint when they told them to get out, but obviously they didn't. It's not clear how they got them out of there. Work at Mindy's stand, and she mentions that they referred to her as Mork's creature. Again, Mindy being treated like she's a pet and she's not worthy of the respect that orkins would give each other. Guess we're alone now. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Just the two of us, huh? Yep, looks that way. <laughs> <laughs> Sure is dark. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> yeah, it's our wedding night. I better not put this off any longer, huh? It's not. <laughs> Betty Davis, I... <laughs> what was that? That's the ancient organ honeymoon ritual. Good night, man. <laughs> the honeymoon ritual was a little different on Earth. What's different, man? No mask? <laughs> gave me this marriage manual to give to you. I told him he was crazy. That's one for Dad. <laughs> Read this. Now? Please. <laughs> Cute picture. Just read, Mark. Understand. No, clear as a bell, man. I'm just going to step in the bathroom for just a minute. Mark? Mark, are you all right? Did that book upset you? No, not at all, really, man. I'm just going to sleep on the bathroom floor tonight, maybe forever. Mark, that's ridiculous. You're not going to sleep in the bathroom. Now, come out here. I want to talk to you. No way, Jose. No chance, Lance. Not tonight, Irving. I have a headache. Mark, you're my husband. I'm not going to let you sleep in the bathroom. If you don't come out, I'm going to come in there and get you. Uh -huh, I'll lock the door. Stupid organs forgot to put a lock on the door. They probably didn't think we'd need one. Now, come on, Mark. Come out of there. Mark. Mark. All right, I'm coming in there. <laughs> We should have gone to Niagara Falls. This is so cute and sweet and flirty and playful. It's not sexy per se, except in this just very light Mork and Mindy kind of sexiness. Then we have things happening with the darkness. I love that the chicken mask is hilarious. It just looks funny, whether it's sitting on Mork's head or on the bed. It looks like he's got eggs on sticks. We have that chicken and egg motif of Ork, and so that made sense. And then 
And he ends the ritual with a reference to Betty Davis' eyes. And again, I laughed out loud. This was a hit for Kim Carnes in the spring of 1981. And Mork says that he's doing an ancient Orkin honeymoon ritual. And I don't know if he went and did research on this or how he knew about this. And it's possible that over the blooms it got distorted. He is trying. When they have the lights going on and off for this conversation, it made me think of Bob and Emily. Hartley on the Bob Newhart show where they have talks in bed trying to clear up misunderstandings and yet definitely a different feel between Mork and Mindy. Mindy is trying to explain as gently as she can that this is not how honeymoons go on earth. And then we find out that Fred gave Mindy a marriage manual to give to Mork and I don't know when this happened. Presumably sometime between them coming back from the church and then changing into the space suits. It's a very thoughtful gift as it turns out the results are a little bit iffy i'm going to guess that fred did not want to have the talk with mork for many reasons i did think it was funny that what he picked out was a very thin book that seems to have a lot of pictures mork of course reads through it very quickly because we know he's a speed reader and it doesn't look like it's much text mork denies that he's upset but he does go and hide in the bathroom and his voice breaks then there's another joke about Mork having a headache, which I talked about, I think, on Mindy and Mork. The sitcom thing of the wife doesn't want to have sex. Not tonight, I have a headache. And then that was turned around and came a thing for Mr. Roper on Three's Company. And here, it's like Mork isn't even clear what sex is, but it looks really scary to him. Because this hotel suite is so poorly put together, they not only have the commode on the wall, I think with the courtesy paper, I forget, there's no lock on it. We get a reference to a more traditional honeymoon location of Niagara Falls. Mindy is very sweet and patient with him, and she just does not want her husband to spend their honeymoon in the bathroom. The next scene is set in a rose garden at night, and we can see three moons in the sky. It's sci-fi, but it's almost like a fantasy setting. And that really suits the mood of this scene because it's also, as it'll turn out, to be very romantic. Mindy enters through an arch and calls out to Mork a few times. She says this is their honeymoon and is this really how he wants to start out their marriage? So she's disappointed, but she also is trying to make clear to him, we need to work this out. This is our first test as a married couple, really. How are we going to handle this? And then, I love this episode, but this is like one of the things I would definitely change. Mork, in what the subtitles describe as an Asian accent, yells that Mork isn't here right now. We even get a little Asian, Oriental, I guess, flourish of music. It's really unnecessary. They could have had him do any voice. They certainly didn't have to have the music play that up. She asked him to please come out here and talk to her. He says, I can't, and then he changes it to, he can't. She gently says his name and he pops out of a rose bush. We can see that his head is bare. I can't remember if he was wearing the nightcap in the scene before he put the chicken head on. He calls her Mind and says she knew it was him all along, didn't she? She says she's psychic. He slowly comes over. She asks why he ran away. He says he likes to hyperventilate alone. She comes closer and takes his hand and then they sit on the bench. She tells him that she realizes for the first time how he must feel on earth. She doesn't know how he copes. I've got you to take care of me. Mm. I haven't told you this, but you know, I think Ork is really a lovely planet. I mean, the three moons are very romantic. Mm. And this garden, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, look, these flowers almost look exactly like earth roses. They should look exactly like earth roses. I've been sending them here for three years now. You see, I want to share a little bit of Earth's beauty with Ork. Oh, you never told me that. That's so nice. They're not as beautiful as you are, though. Oh, thanks. Now, do you want to tell me what's bothering you? I'm scared. Mark, come over here. Oh, Mark, everyone's scared of getting married. It's a new experience. It's a normal emotion. It is? Sure. Oh, Mark, just thanks. Someday we might have children, and I'm scared to death of that. But I know that you'll be there to help me get through it. See, that's the, the really wonderful thing about marriage, is you have a, a friend who loves you and a partner who helps you through the rough times. 
And his friend and partner isn't ashamed of the other friend and partner? No. Not if they love each other. Oh, We're picking a rose? Yeah, we better walk fast. Ooh. This is a national monument, man. Picking that rose would be the same on earth as if you pluck one of Buck Shields' eyebrows. <laughs> this scene and the whole episode emphasizes that they care for each other, both that they are fond of each other and they look out for each other. And they are working towards understanding each other, which was one of those things in the episode where he proposed, I wanted them to sit and talk. And they actually do that more than once in this episode. And it really does make a difference. She tells them that Orc is a lovely planet and the three moons are very romantic, which is true. She admires the roses. And then, oh, I actually let out a happy sob at this part. He tells her that these are earth roses and he's been sending them here for three years. Years. And that was just, oh, feels. Because here he found something on Earth that was beautiful and that could be transplanted. And presumably in that time, the roses have bloomed and spread and become this lovely garden. And then he says they're not as beautiful as she is. It's like, oh, baby. It was interesting. She doesn't say, hey, I think you're scared of sex because you never really understood what it is. And now you have more of a sense of it. And you are maybe scared about performing. You're scared about whether we're physically compatible. None of that conversation happens. And I don't know that it could in this context. But she phrases it as he's scared of marriage. And this is a new experience for him. She says this is a normal emotion. Even in season four, she is helping him work through emotions. And as we know, no, he came from this planet that is not comfortable with emotions. She's trying to tell him it is normal to have emotions and this is one of the emotions that is normal. It's put in universal terms that everybody is scared of marriage. I think that's one reason why she's patient and she wants to work this through with him and so it's just very sweet and reassuring of her. And then she admits, and this would get very ironic far too soon, that someday they might have children. She's scared to death of that but she feels like she will have him to help her with it. That's an interesting confession. Mindy lost her mother when she was very young. She's brought up by her father and grandmother, and so she doesn't have that sort of mother role model, although she has a very nice stepmother. And maybe just the idea of having children is scary in itself. It implies that although Cora and Fred thought that she would not be able to have children, she believes they will. And I don't know if she's maybe thinking that if they can't biologically have them, they could adopt. She would still be nervous about that. So I thought that was ironic and revealing. They describe a spouse as a friend who loves you and a partner who helps you through the rough times. In a way, the clones are right. Mindy is Mork's friend, but she is his best friend and they have this bond and them being married is only going to strengthen their friendship. And then he kisses her hand again. He picks a rose for her symbolism of the pink rose. It's very sweet and romantic, but of course the alarm goes off and we find out that this is actually a national monument. So it's not just a nice rose garden by the hotel, it's an actual national monument. He compares it to plucking one of Brooke Shields' eyebrows because of course Brooke Shields was a teen model and actress, but she did have very prominent eyebrows, particularly by the fashions of that time. They return to the hotel room. I noticed that he was still wearing his chicken feet. And they go back and forth saying that they're back in the room again. And then this turns into him referring to Willie Nelson on the road again, although he doesn't sing. Mark suggests that they watch TV and Orson Knows Best is on. So apparently Orson has a TV show based on him. Mark knows Ork and TV schedule well enough. I didn't realize that Ork had TV programs, but maybe because they've been able to observe Earth programs, they developed their own shows and yeah we had Elnor Donahue on a season three episode. The implication is also that Orson is an authority figure and he simply knows best which of course is not true. Orson is definitely fallible. Mindy says she would rather talk so even though they've had some conversations they're not done yet. She goes over to him with his back still to her but he turns as she says that she never realized until today what it's like to be a stranger on a strange planet and I noticed that she was still holding the pink rose so I thought that was a nice touch that she appreciated this gift and nobody caught them on their way back to the room so she's gonna keep this as a memento. She has learned empathy and you know, what is it like to be the alien? But as bizarre and as scary as Orc has been to me at least I've been here with you. Yeah 
You got there, kid. It's just you and me, sweetheart. Yes, I did. <laughs> They're really emphasizing their togetherness. He does a Humphrey Bogart impression. I think not his first one on the show. So that is meant to make us think of Casablanca, but I think also Bogey and Bacall. It seems like the clones snuck back into the room and were hiding under the bed, but actually Mark explains that that was six and seven, and these are one and two, the originals. One asks Mark and Mindy if they want to hear their latest Orson joke. Mark tells Mindy that if she thinks six and seven are funny, these clones wrote the book. And of course, Mindy didn't think six and seven were funny. Two tells them to hold on to their sides because it's just going to be so hilarious. Orson is a big bathroom. <laughs> I know, Mim, but I just got it. Oh, honey, your delivery's incredible. That's all. Just the way you said, that's all. She's oh. funny. You think she's funny? Well, you read this. <laughs> Why don't you just check that one out for about a week and let me know when you figure it out. <laughs> Whoa. Check that one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rick em, rick em, rick em, rick em. Give that ball a really bad. <laughs> I thought it was nice that they don't mind that Mindy does the punchline. And I don't know that it's necessarily the punchline that they came up with, but they think it's hilarious. And Mark laughs. He calls her honey, which her father does. And he says that her delivery is incredible. And I think that that was a little bit of Robin teasing Pam because she's mostly been the straight woman on this show. It's not done in a cruel way. And then Mark uses the marriage manual as a decoy to get the clones to leave them alone, hopefully for a week. And then, yes, we get that sense or defying cheer again. And I do say he does that elbow thing that he used to do with Remo, like wah, wah, wah. I can't describe it, but you saw it. Mark says that the clones are gone, and Mindy repeats it. Here we are in the room again. Yeah. Just the two of us. Looks that way. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know I, I think I understand your Earth customs. You do? Yeah. I really do care. Mm. Just one thing. Would you wear the chicken head tonight? <laughs> sense the nervousness and anticipation for both of them, I don't know if Mork actually understands because he wants Mindy to wear the chicken head. At first Mindy is stunned, but then she's amused. Maybe he's just being kinky or maybe he's trying to be funny. It's still a very sweet, funny scene. And then we get the tag. Presumably, however long their honeymoon was, it is over and they are on their way back. The egg is zooming across space. Mork in voiceover tells Mindy she's doing great. She says thanks. He tells her to just stay in her lane like their lanes in outer space. It soon becomes clear that he's letting her drive the egg. So I thought that was nice and maybe symbolic. She says that they really should send Orson a nice thank you note. Orson pretty much came across as the villain in the previous two episodes. And here he somewhat redeems himself. By, we'll see what it's like by the time Mark does another report. He apparently arranged everything. They had a wonderful time. Because I had a great time. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what my favorite part was? What? Guess. The pillow fight? No. Yeah, well, uh, no. My favorite part was... My favorite part was waking up in the morning and, and seeing you laying there next to me and, and knowing for the rest of my life your face will be the first one I wake up to every morning. Oh. Ditto, man. <laughs> and I've got one thing to say to you. I wrote in all caps. Cute! Flirty. Silly. Because this is just so, so cute. I mean, we don't know exactly how the rest of their wedding night went, but it looks like they had fun and they are definitely cute and coupley on the way back to Earth. And they've got these Disneyland-like hats with their names on them, but they're propellers instead of ears. And I thought it was cute when he spins her propeller. And they've even got fuzzy dice as souvenirs. 
apparently they had a pillow fight the way they say it it sounds a little bit naughty then there's just this sweet thing of her saying that her favorite part was waking up with him and realizing that she's going to be seeing his face first thing in the morning and he says ditto she said it and he means the same thing but he's just not gonna repeat all that and then they kiss and then they almost hit another meteor and then it says to be continued which might make you think that the next episode is about them running into a meteor but it's actually just kind of a throwaway like earlier it has no impact forgive the pun and again we get stills from this episode in the closing credits i freaking love this episode oh my god it was so wonderful I rate each of these episodes on a 0 to 4 egg scale, which measures how much it delivers what I'm looking for in the series. I still can't give out a 4. This did have that kind of racist moment, and I felt like the supporting characters, I mean, Fred and Cora were great in the scene that we got to see them. They were very much in character and funny and playing off of Mork and Mindy, and the Orkins were fun, but I didn't feel like it was just the most amazing thing possible. So I'm going to go with 3 and three quarters which is the highest I've ever done for instance Mork's mixed emotions I gave a three and a half I just felt like this was so much what I wanted on this show it was funny and topical and sweet and romantic and just very lightly sexy it had lessons but they weren't heavy-handed and it's mostly about Mork and Mindy being together and they're interacting with other people but it is about them love the costumes the sets were fun it was just such a delight. I really don't think the series is going to top this and I'm just so happy that this exists. Even though watching I'm like why couldn't they make the whole season like this? I mean not necessarily going to orc but why couldn't they write on this level? Odd because McRaven and Johnson had such a mix of quality on their other episodes and the last one they did was the Rick and Ruby episode which I did not like at all. Then this is just so perfect. The fish out of water thing but this time Time it's Mindy and so she's learning things about Mork and about herself and about Ork and he's learning things about her and about marriage. They're both in this new territory where he is not really prepared for marriage. He thought that this is what he wanted was to marry Mindy and spend the rest of his life with her but now the reality of it including sex is starting to sink in and he's not sure what to do with that and she wanted to be an adventurous journalist and explore the planet and now she is afraid to leave the hotel room but she does go outside and into that rose garden wow i love this episode like i said i really wish it was an hour long i don't know that there was that much more they could have done but like i said they could have had more with orson they could have had a scene of them in mork's old neighborhood there were other possibilities some of the orkins that we've met like the elder could have shown up that would have been good obviously would have been nice to know exactly what happened physically on their wedding night and beyond but on the other hand it's like okay try and respect their privacy whatever happens spoiler there will be results <laughs> in the very next episode i think or at least the one after that but we'll talk about that don't want to spoil much more but you know you know you know i also rate each of these episodes on a zero to four heart scale which measures how well it supports and promotes the romantic relationship of mork and mindy i gave the season four opener a three and a half and that was where mork proposes to mindy i gave the wedding episode a four out of four which is the only time i've done that because it's just thoroughly romantic and so so shippy this is isn't quite at that level and there's also some other things going on including the stuff about work it's another three and a half such a shippy start to the season as we get deeper in you will understand why i feel the way i do about the later season four episodes because we are starting out with really good egg and heart scales and i realize it's hard to sustain that i'll see how i feel but my impression is that it's like they didn't even try they wanted to make the show something else and i feel like and i'm pretty sure i felt this way when i was 13 watching these air i felt like it was based and switch you promised me mork and mindy married coupley and you gave me this <laughs> 
but there will be things along the way. And it certainly does not take anything away from these first three episodes and this one in particular. Obviously highly recommended, even if you're not a Mark and Day shipper and if you aren't, why are you here? But hey, maybe you watch it for other reasons. I think you still need to watch it for the arc of the show. Not as much as the wedding episode. Them actually going on the honeymoon does matter. It's just a fun episode. And it's sweet. So, so sweet. And I talked about this with season two and season three that I felt like it had lost a lot of its sweetness. That particular sweetness and innocence that it had in season one. And you can't get that back. But it's like they're saying, we can do this in a different way, a more mature way. That is really intriguing to me as an adult. How do you sustain that? And one thing you do is you show they care about each other and it is a bond that has deepened. And so I think that the Rose Garden is a really lovely symbol of that. You plant a rose or send back rose seeds. I'm not sure how he was doing it. And they bloom, become something really lovely. It will be continued, but not how I expected and not with a meteor. But for now, this is Paula Schaffner with episode 72, The Honeymoon, three and three quarter eggs, three and a half hearts. Thank you, Orson. What did you do to me in some kind of